add my welcome to, to that of Tom. It's great to share in fellowship in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, whether you're here or, or whether you're watching the live stream or will watch later on, God bless you. And may the story of Ruth enrich your experience of him because it is a wonderful story. And it is a peaceful story. You've got your Bibles open, I hope, or you can see the text somehow or other. The story of Ruth is set in violent times, the violent times recorded in the book of Judges in the Bible. Over a thousand years before the time of Jesus and before the monarchy in Israel. Ruth, a Moabite woman, is married to an Israelite. When he dies, Ruth shows deep commitment and love towards his, his dead wife, his, his wife, his mother, her mother-in-law, Naomi, and, and she shows a deep devotion to Naomi's God, the God of Israel. In the story, in the end, she finds a new husband among her former husband's relatives, and through this marriage, Ruth becomes King David's great-grandma. Ruth is only mentioned one other time in the Bible, but that's a real wow reference. It's Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. She's a key figure in the genealogy of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus, the Messiah, whom Revelation describes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <coughs> Now, the book of Judges shows the disasters that can strike God's people when they turn away from him. Whilst Ruth, which is set in the midst of this time of chaos, shows how God's faithfulness and love flow through individual lives which are committed to him, despite all they may have to endure. Now, the big Bible picture is that of God's great plan for the redemption of the world through his son, the Lord Jesus. But the intimate story of this brief book is how three key characters, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, reflect the providential loving faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. Now, I want to take you through this section of this remarkable story in light of one of the grandest biblical doctrines, the doctrine of the providence of God. Have you ever queried whether God does really have a handle on your life? Or do you sometimes feel you're like driftwood upon a sea of circumstance, just being tossed backwards and forwards, and God is not really there? It's as though God had left you in the lurch. Do you sometimes feel like that? Years ago now, um, Jenny and I were dead keen on going to Iran uh, to work overseas there. Uh, we had the medicals, everything went through, and then blow me down, they had a revolution, and we couldn't go. <clears throat> Never mind, the mission we were engaged with uh, it was called the Bible and Medical Missionary Fellowship in those days, InterServe today. They said, we will seek God's will for you in East Asia. And so next on the list was Afghanistan, and that didn't work out. And then, what about Nepal? And that didn't work out. So you know what? We came to the London borough of Bexley. <laughs> was God really at work in my life? I did doubt it. I was just so confused about what was happening. Uh, and I tell you this tale because it's God's providential faithfulness and steadfast loving kindness that made me safe in a seeming sea of senselessness. Now last week we saw how Naomi, upon the death of all her menfolk, feels very bitter towards God. She feels she's been left in the lurch does he really care for me? Poverty-stricken, she returns to Israel, to Bethlehem, 
after 10 years as a refugee or economic migrant, I guess, and she returns at harvest time. Now Ruth is totally committed to her mother-in-law and she leaves her own family, her own land, her own religion in order to go with Naomi, to be with her, come what may, and to worship Yahweh, Naomi's God. You know that um, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, if the word Lord is spelt out in capital letters, that is referenced to the name of God, Yahweh. So now, in chapter 2, we meet, uh, having met Naomi and Ruth, we meet the third key character, we meet Boaz. And it's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, in this convergence of these three lives, Naomi begins to see the providence of our loving Heavenly Father at work. That behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. And here is something to gladden our hearts and to confirm our faith as well. Through the swirling currents of COVID and the personal angst and misfortunes that have battered so many of us, God's smiling face looks down upon us, not as a pixelated emoji, but in the person of our risen Lord Jesus and the enduring comfort of the Holy Spirit. And that's great to know in such uncertain times, isn't it? So after meeting Naomi and Ruth <coughs> in chapter 1, chapter 2 introduces us to Boaz, who's been waiting in the wings. There's a bit of a drum roll, and uh, he takes a bow to let us know he's there in ver the very first verse. Uh, and then he steps back off stage to await his dramatic entrance into the story. So verse 1, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Then he disappears momentarily. <coughs> so we rejoin the two women, stuck in Bethlehem, without permanent home or prospects. And we trace their remarkable experience and focus upon two central prayers which demonstrate the impact of God's providence in action and everyday life. And if you want a, a main heading here, then the, the first main heading would be God's providence in Ruth's burden of care for Naomi. God's providence in Ruth's burden of care for her mother-in-law, Naomi. And, and the first prayer we're going to look at is uh, a prayer offered for Ruth by Boaz. It's in chapter 2, verse 12. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. <coughs> the second prayer is for Boaz by Naomi in verse 20. The Lord bless Boaz. And she goes on to declare, God has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead. So backtracking to the first prayer and the run-up to that prayer. Chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, one day, Ruth says to her mother-in-law, let me go to the fields, pick up leftover grain behind anyone who will let me work for him. Uh, and here she's plugging into um, a, a, an ancient text. Uh, we can find it. Um, it's, it's mentioned a couple of times, but in Ruth, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19, God instructs his people when they're in the promised land when you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Right from the very beginning, God has a heart for the underclass, the marginalized, the poor, and the destitute. And that has been reflected throughout scripture both Old Testament and New Testament it is an obligation and responsibility laid upon us as the church of Jesus Christ today the point is that 
When we provide and care for the marginalized and poor, we warm God's heart. That is as true today as it was 3,000 years ago. Which leads to a most interesting fact about Ruth chapter 2. In these 23 verses, there are 19 references to work, either harvesting or reaping or attitudes towards work. Now, because of COVID, many have lost their jobs and approximately four and a half million people have been furloughed and they don't know what's going to happen when the furlough subsidy ends. Others are just unable to find work at all, even though there are 600,000 vacancies in the UK, so they say. With the rundown of government subsidies, here is much apprehension for what's likely to happen. Throw in the fallout from Brexit, many small businesses and retailers are wondering how they're going to cope. We have a right to work. Yes? Well, the Bible doesn't exactly put it like that. You see, any theology of work is not about rights, but about the necessity for work. To work, whether for money or not, is one of the bare necessities of life. You find all this in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. The bare necessities of life, work, beauty, food, law, responsibility, companionship, and fellowship with God. That is what we are made for. It's all there in God's creation ordinances. So we need a daily workout, a daily workout, whether or not it's paid employment. To work is in our DNA. And when we are denied work, something is missing. Now, many people are filling out job applications at this time. And uh, you don't hang around looking for your ideal job. You demonstrate that whatever you've been able to do, paid or volunteer, you've done it like Ruth. Now, what do I mean? At such a time, we want to be assured that our providential God has his hand upon our lives, no matter what. Verses 2 to 7 show us Ruth's attitude regards the burden of care that she has for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Somehow or other, Ruth has to provide for the one she loved. So she asks Naomi if she has permission to do what poverty-stricken aliens and widows did. And Ruth was both. So she went to the harvest fields and at random she chose a, a, a group of harvesters to follow so that she could pick up the leftover barley stalks, though she would be entitled to thresh and keep. Ruth became one of the poorest of the poor so she could care for her beloved mother-in-law. That is God's providence at work through Ruth's burden of loving care. But now it's time for Boaz to take central stage. He comes to see how his harvesters are getting on in the normal course of the day. And the author makes a note that Boaz is a godly man. By the way, he greets uh, his, uh, his harvesters. Uh, the Lord be with you. And uh, they respond, the Lord be with you too. And it's not simply a, a good, good morning kind of greeting that would automatically happen. It's included in the text because it says something about Boaz's character. He runs his business in a, a godly way. So here, if you like, is a, a second main heading uh, for seeing God's providence at work. God's providence at work through Boaz's business. And Boaz comes to his fields, um, uh, not fields with hedgerows around like we would imagine, but um, open plant fields with boundary markers, there would be lots of different uh, people visible doing the, the, the harvesting. And when Boaz comes to his section of, of the fields, he immediately espies a strange young woman 
and his foreman fills him in on Ruth's identity and, impressively, her work rate. So if we look at verses 6 and 7, uh, the overseer replied, She is a Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and she has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So, you know, that's the kind of information you want from a referee. If you're looking for somebody to work for you, you're looking for someone uh, who's a team player, who's a hard worker, who's a good timekeeper, who keeps at the job. And whether you're young or not so young, to develop this kind of attitude to whatever you're doing, even if it's the most appalling, boring, mind-numbing job there is, it's what counts, developing these qualities for doing work, which God wants us to do. Now, Boaz, he's seen Ruth and is interested, and he's impressed by what he's heard about her. And so he gives her some sound advice. He says, look, the plenty of teams of harvesters around, you can see them all over, but don't glean anywhere else. Stay with my men. I've told them to look after you and warn them not to molest you. And tragically, then as now, a common danger for powerless foreign women is to be abused. And Boaz says, look, you're going to be okay. Uh, use their water jars when you're thirsty. Keep going. Now Ruth is amazed and wonders at Boaz's kindness to a stranger. So Boaz tells her why. Boaz has been deeply impressed. He's heard about Naomi and her foreign daughter-in-law. Ruth has done an Abraham. Like the patriarch, she set out for an unknown land, an unknown future, not, once, what, not knowing what's going to happen. And she's told Naomi, your God will be my God. And it's implied she would have prayed regards her commitment to go with her mother-in-law. Boaz was impressed by the measure of her sacrificing of her home, her family, her land of birth to be with Naomi. And so Boaz prays for Ruth. He's heard about her and he prays for her. Verse 11. I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. Now you left how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. In Boaz's eyes, Ruth has deserved good things. Boaz thinks, and he prays to Yahweh, the God of Israel, that she will be blessed at Yahweh will bless her and pay her wage in full. That, that's the, the meaning of, of, of the Hebrew word. And, and that she will receive all that God has for her, for her commitment to Naomi and her commitment to the God of Israel. And in due course, we see that Boaz himself will be the means of answering his prayer and you know that happens so often for us as well, isn't it? We pray for someone for some situation and then in some amazing way, God uses us to be the answer to our prayer. And that's something to hold in mind when we do pray for other people. Lord, is there something I can input to this particular situation that I'm praying about? Now God knows what you've been through. He knows what you're going through right now. Despite being the equivalent of a penniless widow, you're committed to your burden of caring. Whoever it may be within your own family, within your church, within your neighborhood, just as Ruth was committed to her care for her mother-in-law, Naomi. So may the Lord bless you richly, Ruth. You've come as a refugee to shelter under the wings of the God of Israel. My prayer for you, says Boaz, is that you will experience the reward that he gives to his faithful, obedient, loving people. So Boaz prays. And if you're in a dark place right now, and you may be, 
then this prayer is for you as well. As you move forward, take refuge under the wings of the God of Israel as he has revealed himself in our precious Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Psalm 17, verse 8, puts it this way. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. There is a prayer for dark places. God's providential care is there for those who trust him. We know it more familiarly in the words of the 23rd Psalm. Even though I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. Let's move on with our story. In verse 13, we read uh, Ruth's uh, response. Uh, May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. Ruth's reply shows her appreciation of Boaz's kindness. You know, his words must have meant a great deal for Ruth. They represent the first cheerful thing recorded as happening to her since the death of her husband in Moab. Then um, Ruth is invited to lunch our fresco, um, just like we're allowed to enjoy now. And as a special mark of favor, Boaz gives her roasted grain from his own hand. He makes sure she has plenty to eat. And, and the question rises right now, is this just to honor Ruth for her commitment and her hard work? Or is he starting to become interested in Ruth as a woman? Well, you have to wait until next week to find that out. So our first main heading was God's providence in Ruth's burden of care for Naomi. Our second heading, God's providence at work through Boaz's business. And thirdly, God's providence encourages Naomi's battered faith. Ruth returns home to Naomi with a bumper crop of gleaned and fresh barley. She's also saved some of her lunch to share. Her mother-in-law is impressed and asks about her day. Uh, when she learns that it was a field belonging to Boaz, Naomi gets really excited. She starts to pray for him and to praise the Lord. And so you get that in verse 20. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead. And she added to Ruth, this man is our close relative. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers, our guardian redeemers. Now, poor Naomi, who's been filled with bitterness for what God has let her suffer, finds her faith beginning to be rekindled. The Lord God of Israel has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She felt she was like one of the dead. Everything had gone from her life. But now she perceives that God has been there. The word for kinsman redeemer, chesed, sorry, the word for, for, for God's covenant faithfulness, chesed, and loving kindness towards his people. God has not stopped this kindness, this blessing. And, and it, it's, it speaks of the intimate love of God for his people, the faithfulness of God for his people. God will remain faithful because of his love for us expressed in our Lord Jesus Christ. When providence may seem like a cruel joke to us, remember that God is faithful in his loving mercy for us. Anyway, Naomi's cock a hoop. He's our relative through my husband Elimelech. Here's a connection. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers, our guardian redeemers. One of the people who is obligated by clan traditions to offer us care and support. You have to wait until next week to find out what all that means. But Naomi stresses that Ruth must remain with Boaz's reapers and gleaners, no matter what. She mustn't gravitate towards any other field. Right on throughout the barley and wheat harvests, every day Ruth is out gleaning and she continues to support and care for her mother-in-law. From the famine in Judah that had driven Elimelech to take his family to Moab, 
through her sons marrying pagan wives, through their tragic deaths and subsequent poverty, to Ruth's commitment to Israel's God and her hard work on the part of her beloved mother-in-law and her seeming random choice of Boaz's field and Boaz turning up and seeing Ruth on her first day at work, happenstance? No. All this was the outworking of God's providential care for Naomi and Ruth. And as we shall see, his providence at work for all Israel and the whole of humanity through a descendant of Ruth and Boaz. Great David's greater son, Jesus. God's providential love weaves his presence throughout all the changing scenes of our lives. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Do you understand that? Come what may. You don't need a textbook to grasp the wonder and the blessing of the providence of God. Just live your life for him. Live your life with him. Trust in his faithful covenant loving kindness. Listen to these words by the 18th century William Cooper. He was a mate of John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace. Here is the doctrine of the providence of God in a nutshell. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break with blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. So as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for God is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. And as he reflects in Romans chapter 8, nothing in the whole of creation can separate us from God's covenant for faithfulness and love in Jesus Christ our Lord. And as in the lives of Naomi, Ruth and Boaz, so too in our lives, do you believe that? You don't know how it's all going to pan out. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain in due course. So, don't miss next week's exciting episode. Will Ruth follow Naomi's advice? And if she does, will she stay safe? Is there romance in the air? Has Boaz been smitten with love at first sight? Will Naomi truly discover the providential care of God's redeeming loving kindness? Well, find out, same time, same place, next Sunday. Let's pray. Lord, there's so much we don't understand about the mysteries of life, but we put our hands in your hand, and we are kept by your loving faithfulness to your word through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.